Hey everyone, apologies for the late start. We were just having some audio visual uh, issues as it sometimes happens. Um, so I see people are joining in now. We're just gonna give it maybe another minute just to make sure that uh, everyone is ready to go uh, before we get started. Um, I see more and more people joining. Thank you again for your patience. Uh, tech fails us today. Must be the rain. All right, um, thank you guys uh, for joining us today. And once again, apologies for the late start. Um, today, we are going to be uh, talking about embracing artificial intelligence. Uh, now, if my uh, trusty little PowerPoint person can please go to the next slide. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I am Andrea, product specialist here at ProdPad and your host for today uh, and with me uh, somewhere in this uh, new wonderful building that we have as our new office, our uh, Will Newmarch, our technical lead, uh, and Jenna Basto, our co-founder and CEO. Uh, so just so you guys know, uh, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, we've got some slides for you. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, be sure to pop them into either the QA uh, or the chats um, options uh, in your Zoom panel. Uh, we will be going through those and answering them uh, later on. Uh, and I will be reading them back, so no worries. Uh, and with that said, uh, Will and Jana, on to you guys. Hey, hey thanks so much for uh, setting this all up, Andrea. And thanks for uh, hosting us today. Um, I, I love that we're tackling the topic of embracing artificial intelligence, and yet here we are, you know, just trying to set up a basic web call uh, to chat to everybody, and even that type of thing is still, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> difficult to get going and that sort of thing. Uh, welcome to the, the eve of 2020 and uh, web conferencing is still difficult. Uh, but let's look ahead to what is actually possible with things like artificial intelligence. You know, maybe in the next decade, it'll actually solve this type of problem or not. I mean, this is what we're here to discuss and, uh, and figure out, um, you know, what, what does it mean to us as product people? Uh, so let's take you to, uh, let's go uh, talk about a little um, uh, story because um, I've got a, a little backstory about some ProdPad history here. Um, so tech companies have this long history of setting up elaborate gags for April Fool's Day uh, where they announce product and service updates that just basically stretch the imagination, right? And the trick to a good April Fool's joke is to outline something that's like on brand for the company uh, that's vaguely in the realm of believability but has absurd enough details that it's not to be taken seriously. And it's usually as you start reading through the blog article or the post or the page that they've put up that you start realizing that there's something that's, uh, that's taking you for a fool there. Uh, Google, uh, you might remember, uh, I think this was one from 2008. Uh, Google has always been famous for their, uh, their April Fool's joke. You might remember when they launched TISP, a free broadband service, which is um, access to the plumbing system. Uh, so quite literally, they, they told you that they would send you a box that you flush down the toilet and you'd get free broadband. Uh, that was launched on April 1st. <laughs> uh, they also launched Google Paper, a service by which your emails would be printed out and snail mailed. Um, and see, like stuff like this is just absurd enough, and yet somehow within the realm of possibility, especially knowing all the other bizarre things that Google has done in the past and with, 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 with their budget. So, uh, backstory, in 2013, ProdPad was a very new company, uh, the ProdPad team decided to give an April Fool's joke a go. Uh, on April 1st of that year, we announced the launch of a feature that we, that we thought was compelling but absurd. Right? What we called it was the Auto-Magical Roadmap. It was a roadmap that built itself without the help of a product manager. Uh, and we, we, we had this joke, and we talked about this in the article itself. Um, we had uh, what we called highly advanced big data crunching algorithm technology that would take to your backlog of ideas that would automatically render a complete and accurate product roadmap. We made the ultimate claim that it would do the hardest part of product management without any people at all. It would get buy-in from your stakeholders on your roadmap using a system of advanced natural language processing and AI processing all that stakeholder feature requests, all those feature requests that you have, all that feedback, comparing it to the product specs that you have and your product's 
company vision, uh, your, 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 your product vision that you have, uh, and compiling an automated tailored response to each of your team members and other stakeholders who'd otherwise question this new roadmap. And so we jokingly positioned it as the perfect replacement for product managers and heralded it as the end of needing to have product people at all. Now, of course, this is a, a joke. We put it out on April 1st and, you know, we thought that some people would, you know, share it around and have a little laugh. Uh, what we didn't realize is that it was going to slightly backfire because we had some people reaching out to us, um, quite a number of them, asking about how they actually activated their auto magical roadmap tool. Um, at which point we had to add a little bit of a disclaimer to update our uh, April Fool's blog post. Um, so uh, uh, we had to actually go back and point out that there's no way we could actually deliver this thing. The technology we were talking about didn't exist and uh, you know, product managers are not going to be replaced. Um, <laughs> but what we did like is that it certainly caught the imagination of product people uh, and uh, gave us something to, to think about. Uh, that was, I think, the last April Fool's joke that we came up with um, because we were afraid of creating new other far reaching products that people would actually take us seriously on and we'd have to, you know, talk about how we were going to deliver. Uh, we want to be careful with that sort of thing. So, I mean, here we were talking about highly advanced big data crunching algorithm technology and advanced natural language processing and AI. Um, and today that kind of stuff just sounds par for the course. I mean, lots of apps we talk about um, employ this sort of technology. Um, so, you know, is it something that, uh, that, that we have available to use in our actual day-to-day -day products? Is it something that's actually applicable to our stuff or is it still something that's a little bit far reaching and still a little bit uh, too new to be applicable to the products that we're actually building? Um, so let, I wanted to start with uh, talking about, um, you know, what actually is AI? And this is a good time to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Will. Um, Will, are you on the line as well? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> All right, so Will has got his AB sorted out as well. So happy to introduce Will. Um, Will is our uh, technical lead. Uh, he's been with the ProdPad team uh, since, uh, what was that, our early 2017 he joined us? Uh, so it's been several, about three years, yeah. Yeah, several years now, coming up to three years. Uh, and so you've seen ProdPad evolve quite a lot in that time. Um, and also in that time, you actually uh, completed your master's in, um, uh, in AI. Do you want to elaborate on that and uh, tell us a little bit about your background before you jump in? Yeah, of course. So, um, my, yeah, my journey with ProdPad's been... Uh, been about three years now. If I was um, hired as, as a developer, and you very, very kindly let me um, uh, do my part-time masters on the side as well. Um, which has been a great insight into um, advanced uh, software engineering, but also obviously the world of AI, machine learning, and um, I, it's been a great opportunity to then uh, experiment with that and, and try and like put that into um, put that into a real product as well. Um, so yeah, so I mean, obviously AI is a huge um, um, a huge area. It's uh, AI is a, a, a bit of an umbrella term, really. Wide, sort of a, a wide variety of algorithms and uh, uh, things like that, that can can be combined to create um, intelligent systems of sorts, um, uh, either individually or together. Um, it's uh, the thing about AI is um, it sounds very Hollywood, but actually ranges a lot in terms of complexity. Um, uh, so basically, so AI can be like as simple as like a decision tree, or if implemented well, it can be uh, as if it's like acting or thinking rationally in some way, Think, thinking like deep mind, some sort of consciousness, in, in, in sort of uh, in, in sort of more Hollywood terms. And so, I mean, one of the biggest questions is, will our apps ever have some sort of consciousness? Um, I think that companies like Google and that like to think they would. Um, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, but then. That's just my opinion, really. Um, so, but the other thing is we need to remember that we don't really have um, a clear definition of what human intelligence is. Um, so without a definition of what intelligence is, how can we create artificial intelligence? Um, I like to think of uh, simplifying AI as um, the understanding of uh, delegating to computers. Um, so moving on. Um, 
a one of the one of the first uh, proposed names for this field that we now know as AI was actually experimental epistemology. Epistemology being the study of knowledge. Um, actually, a uh, definition of epistemology is the theory of knowledge, especially with regard to its methods, validity, and scope. However, artificial intelligence was more Hollywood, and so obviously caught on more quickly. If this name had caught on instead of artificial intelligence, then we might have had a much easier time describing what we're on about. Um, however, we have this <laughs> quite glamorous term for, for what is essentially just a lot of uh, algorithms and things put together in a clever way to, to think or, well, not really to think, more, more to act like they are um, uh, intelligent in some way. I really like this term, experimental epistemology. It sort of feels a little bit more approachable as somebody who's a product builder. Um, you know, we are the type of people to experiment and uh, try to find things that, that work and improve upon them. Whereas artificial intelligence sort of feels like it's the, you know, some sort of perfect existing system that uh, that we'll never actually get to. I guess sort of um, uh, going off the whole thing that you said, like, you know, we, we haven't even defined what intelligence means to, to us as humans or to other creatures. So how do we define what that is? How do we know we're done when we're talking about artificial intelligence? So interesting use of terms here as well. Exactly, yeah. Um, moving on again, the, uh, the, uh, there's four really nice definitions of AI. Um, and, and every sort of AI system can fall into one of these. It's a great way of um, giving you a sort of understanding of, of uh, what we try and aim for when we're building systems like this. And some people aim for particular things and some people aim for other things, but they tend to all call it AI. Um, some of it's quite scary, some of it's actually just, you know, almost quite boring in a way, these algorithms are saying that. So um, the first of four is, so yeah, you can see these four lined up on this table. Um, so, so these are actually divided into um, thinking and acting and being like a human or just being rational. So uh, to think is actually quite difficult. Like what is thinking? And um, we can delve into what is a consciousness? Um, do we even have time for a conversation on what consciousness is? I don't think we do. Like that's like, you know, years worth of philosophy going into that. Whether we even have some sort of consciousness or whether we are just like, you know, a jumble of physical mechanics going on. Um, so thinking is quite a difficult one to actually comprehend. Um, to act. It's much more simple, like the, the phrase to act is simply to take action. So um, this is a much more easy one to emulate as a system. Um, to be human, um, is being human a good thing? Uh, humans are biased and are not always good at acting rationally. And actually they're, they're rarely good at actually acting rationally. Though it's obviously subjective to uh, the rationale that they're trying to achieve. And that obviously leads on to uh, being rational. Uh, again, um, it's uh, based on the importance of uh, reason or logic, it, it, but that can differ depending on the domain that you're talking about. Uh, so these four uh, definitions, categories, are a really great way of actually thinking about AI and uh, giving you that sort of understanding as to what you're trying to achieve with that. Which of these do you think is the most um, useful and uh, attainable of these? Attainable, I would say, uh, systems that act rationally. Um, I think thinking is quite a hard one to talk about as, as an artificial system because, again, we really don't know what, like, how, we, how humans think in a way. It's, it's, it's more about um, you can tell how they're acting and actually there's, there's, there's a bit of a argument to say whether we are actually even thinking at all or whether we're just acting on physical impulses all the time. Mm. Um, so the, 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 the more, uh, maybe dangerous is not the word really, but the, the, uh, the one that is possibly, uh, that we should be aiming for less is thinking like humans. So you can make a system that acts like a human, maybe like a chatbot, something like that. Uh, you can try and make a system that thinks rationally, but a system that acts rationally is going to be uh, quite dry, quite understandable, and usually much more useful and predictable than the others. Okay, interesting take. Obviously, um, why does this matter? Um, that's, that's another big question, but obviously for, for knowledge workers and people in general, a lot of mundane tasks um, are part of their job, part of their role. Uh, the role of a product manager can be quite complex. Um, 
but uh, there's, a, there's a fair bit of grunt work in, in that role as well. And um, any, any sort of mundane tasks that can be taken off a PM's hands is, is really useful in freeing up that time, freeing up that headspace in, in, to allow you to actually be creative and to allow you to like really get much more value from your role as well and allow, allow your company to get much more value from you as well. So um, going back to the idea of AI being delegated to computers, um, AI can help like, relieve some of those mundane and repetitive tasks uh, and free product managers up to focus on, on the more human tasks that like their role entails. They can have more fun with their role and their output, output can be more useful. The AI can kind of speed up those mundane and, and repetitive tasks and um, even, even like show things that you may not have seen already that, that might take you much longer to actually get around to seeing. It's not something that you wouldn't be able to achieve by yourself, but it, it, it will free you up more to do what you're better at and what you're better at is being more human, more mm. creative. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, we look at it through the lens of what uh, product managers are doing. And the reality is, is that there's knowledge workers and humans all around the world who have busy work, grunt work, just stuff that takes up time uh, that could actually be offloaded um, and is being offloaded. Uh, the tools that we have today are helping them uh, do work faster and more efficiently. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, AI based tools are starting to uh, take some of the weight off people um, as we speak. Um, somebody actually had a um, uh, really good uh, question um, or um, uh, somebody's just weighed in pointing out that um, using uh, natural language processing to scan uh, input for evidence and um, like weighting and understanding features and requirements and problem statements is uh, an obvious potential use case. Uh, which is actually really interesting to um, uh, that that to bring up because uh, it's actually something that uh, that we've actually been talking about and uh, and even working on here. Uh, perhaps a good chance to introduce our uh, hey. dot bot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think I think the the role of um, product manager obviously entails a lot of um, uh, sort of manual natural language processing in a way anyway there's a lot of customer feedback a lot of uh, ideas written down in different uh, ways and you're trying to combine those and understand them create some sort of relationships between them to understand what your um, what your priorities are going to be going forward with that so dotbot is um, a simple ai agent if you will uh, it's an asynchronous process that tinkers around the back of product ad to occasionally appear, appear sorry behind part of the ui currently uh, to give you some suggestions and help speed up the triage of your backlog. It's important to note that Dotbot is only semi-autonomous, so it still requires the human input to make the final decision on its recommendations, but um, it's there to try and find those, um, uh, those sort of correlations between your feedback, between your ideas, between, and between the two together as well, to actually um, speed up that triaging process. Uh, it's got a lot of potential, though currently it's only designed to help speed up, speed tri sorry, uh, <laughs> speed up triaging. Um, so this, is, this involves sort of ideas and feedback being related, related to each other, related to other ideas, other feedback. Um, and it works by analysing the unique content of a user's backlog and then working out what ideas and feedback might relate. So this is obviously unique to each person's backlog. We haven't got any sort of assumptions going on there or anything like that. The algorithm finds strong correlations between the, uh, the text and uh, it gives the user the option to link the resource as a related or duplicate. Uh, Dotbot is our, our first step in implementing AI and machine learning to aid product managers. And while it's subtle, it's definitely an important beginning in the journey towards introducing product management into the world of AI. And it has a lot of potential going forward and we're excited to see where this thing goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We only launched Dotbot, uh, what was that, maybe a month, a uh, month and a half ago or so. Um, so Dotbot's relatively uh, new to the ProdPad um, platform. And what we're finding is uh, once Dotbot appeared in the interface, people starting to ask questions about um, how it works, whether Dotbot can do things automatically, um, you know, where the percentages come from, uh, that sort of thing. So really interesting to see how people interact with it and where it comes from. Uh, other little tidbit from our history, 
the, the dark depths of when we were building Prodpad in the early days, we actually attempted to build something like this um, that would, um, uh, I'm not sure if you know, but as you type a, a new idea in Prodpad, um, this has existed for a while, but you can, um, uh, it'll, it'll find an idea that uh, if it matches based on the language that you're using, it'll help point out that you can um, uh, like a similar idea rather than create a new one. So it helps prevent duplicates. Uh, Dotbot is based on something very, very similar. Um, but years ago, we actually attempted to create something in Prodpad, uh, but the technology wasn't there and it just sort of crunched the, the back end and everything went too slow and the, the recommendations weren't very good. So it's actually really interesting to see what is possible now and how much less effort it took to pull together Dotbot with new technology and new skills that we have versus what we what we couldn't do, what we envisioned was possible, um, you know, five years ago. Um, it, it really bodes well for what we think we can do in several years time as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing Dotbot and uh, related features uh, evolve. Um, now, I guess that takes us to um, another question, which is, you know, are, are we going to make product managers obsolete? Um, now let's put it this way. Humans are not going to be replaced by artificial intelligence anytime soon. The robots are not rising. Um, uh, I think the, you know, capabilities that we're showing with um, things like Dotbot and other tools of its ilk are interesting um, and helpful and certainly take the grunt work out. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, there's, the, the, we're not at uh, risk of replacing any um, uh, humans from doing a, a human-centric role like product management. Um, I remember some uh, in early days at Prodpad, someone said to me that the goal of any truly disruptive product should be to replace a role, like a, a type of uh, role or title or something like that. Otherwise, it's not thinking big enough. And it set me off thinking about what a, a product manager really does uh, and what sort of technology and product change or changes would actually need to be in place to actually replace a product manager. Um, and so it's a nice little thought experiment that I go back to every once in a while. Um, and, you know, as I said, let's just say that for now our jobs are safe. Um, you're definitely going to see an influx of tools like Dotbot and other helpers to give a hand with the grunt work. Um, but at its core, product management is a human centric role. That's best when the product person can take advantage of their adaptability. Um, Will, I think you said it really well when you said that it allows the product manager to get back to being creative. Um, and uh, I think that's a really important trait that uh, we take for granted in, in people um, and what we're actually capable of doing and how important that is to our ability to uh, come up with different solutions and devise experiments and uh, 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 find Definitely. novel solutions to problems. Yeah, of course, like um, humans are inherently really creative and adaptive um, in any setting they're put in. So, um, mm -hmm. This is obviously a massive um, part of our product management role is to, to, to yeah. be, and we are, humans are adaptable resources. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what does this mean? Oh, I love that gift, by the way. Um, so <laughs> humans are adaptable and this is like, this has been the key to our survival for like, obviously forever, basically. I mean, we've been able to adapt to the environment that we've been in and that's been in, like, we've been able to take anything that's perturbing us in some way and like, work out, be, be creative and work out ways to get around it in order to carry on surviving. So in the role of product management, winding one forward obviously, um, you have to see the market, see what the customers want, see what the feedback's like, see where you need to be going and constantly change that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that, that path, uh, that roadmap, if you will, to mm -hmm. um, adapt to what the product needs. And you can't really plan too far ahead at any one time because that might change. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, so obviously inherently a product manager has to be adaptive and creative. This is something that's really difficult, if not impossible for technology, because you're, you're going to have to come up with that algorithm to achieve that. And that's <laughs> why, like, you know, we've already got humans to do that for us. So <laughs> I yeah. don't think it's going to come around anytime soon. It's, it's, it's a point. It's hard enough to train a human to understand all the different facets of good product management, let alone train a, a system to do so. I mean, what are the inputs? How do you, how do you, how do you manage that? How do you, how do you uh, 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 measure it and uh, give the positive reinforcement to, to train it along the right path and make sure that it's heading in the right direction? Um, I, I don't know, and I don't think anybody does know yet um, if, it, if it's all uh, an achievable goal. 
Um, I mean, I would say that humans as adaptable, uh, the, the human adaptability is its most defensible feature. Like if robots are rising and, you know, us product managers are the ones helping it along and training these, these AI bots all over the place, then, you know, humans uh, ability to be endless, uh, endlessly adaptable is um, our, our biggest uh, defensible feature. Uh, and it's also, and I think it's also why we're such champions of lean thinking and agile ways of working. Um, I think these things go hand in hand almost naturally um, because by being agile, it allows you to take advantage of being adaptable um, in ways that no machine can even begin to match. Um, and in terms of looking at the, uh, like what is actually possible, um, and I actually love that somebody in the uh, the chat has actually posted um, an article that they talked about supposing what uh, a smart, um, let's call it automagical roadmap might be. And I'd love to compare notes and see if they've come up with some of the same questions that we have. Uh, because years ago, as we found out, we joked about this AI system that would make this un, you know, this this perfect unquestionable roadmap based on the data on, in your backlog. Um, and of course, we were joking. We knew that there were a lot of assumptions that would be blasted apart as soon as we started, um, you know, cracking the, 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 the door open on that one. Um, but if you were to look at this in terms of, you know, is this in the realm of possibility in the future? Um, well, it looks at a few assumptions, like number one, having perfect data, assuming that all the data that you're inputting into this system uh, is, is reliable and is in fact the right information and there's no information missing. Um, and I think uh, for a long time coming, humans are gonna be needed to read and interpret and empathize with the problems and the feedback and the information that they're getting in so that they can understand and do something with that, that information. Um, and I think there's also uh, uh, an assumption of based around having control over the relationships, right? Like um, road mapping is storytelling at the end of the day. It's you telling the story of how you're going to uh, meet your product vision. Um, and I think human relationship management, having that relationship with other humans is needed in order to get an understanding of problems and communicate that back. Um, you know, our joke about the original auto magical roadmap was that it would just automatically update people based on the information in a really harsh, um, sarky way. Uh, and I don't think that would fly at all. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, a roadmap is not a plan. It's not designed to be this list of things to go do. It's meant to be a prototype for your strategy. It's a way of laying out what your assumptions are so you can take it to other humans um, and check whether your assumptions are right or not. Um, and it's really no different than prototyping for a new feature, right? So if you're working on a new feature, you would draw something out on a piece of paper and take it to another human and ask what they think. And maybe they tell you it's a bad idea and you change where that button is on that page and throw out that piece of paper. Um, but the, the value in, the, um, in the, the, the conversation or the value in that process is not the prototype, that piece of paper, the value is in the process of prototyping, right? That, that conversation you're having, that checking of assumptions. And just with road mapping, um, the, the process of um, road mapping is not the road map itself. Um, so creating an auto magical road map from a backlog of data is not particularly useful. It's actually having that conversation with other humans and checking like, okay, are we on the right track? Like, do we agree that this is the right uh, direction for us? Do we agree that this is going to help solve some big problems for us? Um, and so until AI has figured out how to prototype like a, a minor feature, I don't think it can even begin to prototype a strategy at a road mapping level. Um, and going back, remember this was 2013 that we were supposing this. And I think um, back then people still expected it to lay out their ideas in some format like this timeline roadmap that we got showing here. Um, but the, the, the reality is, is that having anyone, whether it's a human or an AI system, attempt to plan out the months ahead with no room for adaptation means that they're cutting off the people in the organization from doing what they do best, which is learn and adapt. Um, so even if you did auto magically create this roadmap, um, it doesn't give anybody room to go, well, actually, you know what, we, we built the first three things that you said on the map roadmap and turns out, you know, the next five things are no longer valid because we learned X along the way. Uh, and so there's so many tripping points in this concept, uh, but it was a fun thought experiment and uh, a fun article to get out there and certainly um, got a, a few eyebrows raised at the time. Um, so, you know, uh, 
even if we could create a rudimentary version of your roadmap, we, we, we wouldn't recommend following it any further than you follow your own roadmap before wanting to step, stop and check and measure and iterate on it. And so again, that comes down to the process being roadmapping, which roadmapping is just the process of having conversations with other humans about what your assumptions are, what your strategy is. Um, and you know, that is not something that AI is going to replace. And I think, you know, this is how we're looking at it from the lens of product people, but I think every knowledge worker type of role has some sort of similar thing. Uh, if you try to solve problems for marketers or for salespeople or for uh, CEOs or for customer support people or whoever else, there's always going to be grunt work that we can create tools that help them with, but there's always going to be parts of the job that require humans to have conversations with other humans and check their assumptions and have that connection and that relationship. Uh, and so that's why I think it's really interesting to talk about AI at this point. Um, so in conclusion, I've just sort of wrapped up the things that we've talked about before we open it up for questions. I see that we've got a couple of questions already. Um, but we talked about AI as this far flung idea for real product improvements um, <laughs> and, you know, looked at what was um, actually possible today. We looked at what AI actually is um, and uh, got some really uh, interesting food for thought from Will on that. And we looked at why it actually matters to us as product people as well. Um, with that, I'm sure that we probably have some questions and I see that there's a couple in there. Um, Andrea, do you want to uh, uh, jump in and help out with the questions? Absolutely. Um, so, well, we have one comment and one question, so I'll read back the question. Uh, more for Will. Uh, will Dotbot have learning capabilities um, as things are being linked in order to refine suggestions? At the moment, it's uh, in its real early stages, so we've got some algorithms in there to try and, try and um, do as much as it can without uh, taking anything away and building some sort of state. But we're hoping to um, look into how people are linking stuff and unlinking stuff. Um, there's an option to mark things as not related as well in that slide out. So you can mark it as duplicate related or even not related. And we're hoping to take some learnings from that and improve Dotbot in that way. So at the moment it doesn't learn, but it should do in the future, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> so really key takeaway is that we're learning from having Dotbot out there from all the different pieces of feedback and insights that we're getting from our customers. Uh, and maybe one day in the future, Dotbot itself becomes sort of self-learning. Absolutely. Um, the comment that we had uh, was just to raise the fact that um, AI can always be linked to an analytical tool uh, to suggest and prioritize items, uh, which is sort of what Dotbot does, right? Like kind of raises items that might be related. Um, there's no prioritization involved at this point. Um, mm. I still think uh, prioritization takes that little bit of human touch um, to consider things that might be outside of what's on the screen. Yeah. Um, so I, I was. Uh, yeah, yeah, I always find that one uh, an interesting one, like the concept of connecting to analytics to make suggestions on things. Um, and the one thing that I always, whenever somebody says like, hey, can I, um, uh, you know, do this thing um, and connect here in order to make this process faster or smarter or something else? And my response is always to look at it in terms of um, uh, uh, what are you doing as a human right now? Um, like, how are you looking at your analytics? Um, what are those different connection points and what questions do you ask of your analytics? And oftentimes I find that even the humans struggle to answer those questions. And it's like, well, until we figure out what the humans are trying to do, there's no way we can train the, 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 the AI to do something better with it. Um, you know, AI is not at this point that it can um, understand our intended impact and outcomes and uh, find its own route to it. The best that it can do is sort of um, pave the path that we've already been taking and find faster, more efficient routes to get there. Absolutely. Um, we have another very interesting question, which is, uh, are we misrepresenting AI by anthropomorph, anthropomorph I can't say that word. Anthropomorphizing <laughs> machines. <Thank you. laughs> yes, in particular by overlaying gender and personality, implying it has human traits. Um, I think that's fascinating because we actually made a decision internally to not give Dotbot a gender of any sort. It, it's an it, not a human. 
Uh, but um, I, I, I think so. I mean, that my take would be yes, um, taking Alexa uh, yeah. as, as a great example. I mean, it's a female helper. Come on. <laughs> uh-huh. I, yeah. I personally, sorry, I'm going to jump in here. I think it's purely subjective. Uh, and I think it's really, really, really crucial that it's considered before it's uh, considered really well before it's even attempted, which is one reason why we, we did take that bot and, and make it completely unhuman as, as much as possible because it, you, you need to have that reason. Like obviously uh, you might have a case where you need humans to be able to feel like um, their interaction with the system is, is more friendly, uh, more, more communicative. Um, and they, they might be happier to um, interact with that. There, there's a, a good example is there's a robot that goes around. Um, there's been prototype going around hotels to de- deliver, you know, if you forget your toothbrush or something, this robot will go around uh, to your room and deliver you a toothbrush. And it means that someone from reception doesn't have to then go, you know, up, up 10 floors and across, you know, uh, to get to your room to give you this toothbrush. And uh, one thing they uh, really focused on was making this robot seem really, really, uh, friendly and approachable because you've got to approach this robot to take your toothbrush and if it's just like a you know a metal block you, you, it's, gonna be a bit, it's gonna be a bit weird so it's definitely a case-by-case basis i think i think the difficult thing is though every human's take on um something like that is going to be different so someone's going to be really delighted by it there's always going to be someone at the end of this other end of the spectrum that's really offended by it um, yeah. and it's just a really hard one to get right and, and there's always going to be that that sort of um, that difficult uh, case to uh, yeah. case by case, you know, to consider. And and I, I would actually argue that we are guilty of anthropomorphizing, um, even on our side with with Dotbot, because uh, Dotbot has been given a a name, um, a, a human esque sounding name, if if you will. Um, Dotbot has arms and stands up and waves and says, "Hey, are you looking to connect this stuff?" Which is you know quite a human trait, even though we did make the decision to you know leave the the gender neutral and not try to to turn it into a girl bot or a boy bot. Um, we did humanize it in a certain way. Um, and I think that was sort of a, you know, almost a, 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 a human reaction to what we thought was this little helper within the app. And we went, oh, wouldn't it be cute if it had this little arm and it came to help you out? Um, and I think it's something that, um, just like anything else, needs scrutiny and testing and experimentation, um, just like any other feature in the app. Um, you know, it seemed to fit well with our sort of, um, our, our dot mascot style. Um, and I think it's just another element that needs to be tested. Um, so far, we're finding that it's sort of this little delighter. When people see it pop up, they're like, oh, hello. Yes, what have you got for me today? <laughs> uh, which, um, you know, uh, is, is great. And I've just seen a, a, another comment pop up. Somebody's just said, thank heavens, it's not the paperclip, though. Um, and absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, we, 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 we did put that down on paper saying, okay, make sure it's not like Clippy. We don't want it to be annoying like Clippy. We want it to be helpful. So if Dotbot does come up, then, you know, make sure it actually does have useful information. It's only got matches for, you know, it's actually got something good for you. Um, and, uh, you know, be, be ready to um, listen to the feedback and iterate on Dotbot based on what we actually learn. Definitely. Uh, while we hopefully wait for a couple more questions to come through, uh, I'm going to give you guys a minute or two. Um, I, yes, sorry, go ahead. I, I had another um, uh, thought on that um, concept of anthropomorphizing. Um, and this is actually borrowing from somebody else's talk that I saw recently. I think it was at UX Brighton. Um, somebody was talking about AI. And uh, uh, they made the point that um, uh, you have to be careful with anthropomorphizing, particularly genderizing. And they made the point that all of the helpers that sort of do the mundane stuff like, um, you know, Siri and Cortana and Alexa, all these apps are uh, women, usually by default, women voices. Um, and they, they're the ones who, you know, do your task list and do your shopping and tell you the weather. Whereas the ones that have been developed for uh, business intelligence, like um, IBM Watson, um, tend to have male sounding names, um, which, you know, it's almost as if we've been creating these, um, you know, uh, gendered issues directly into our, our um, 
uh, apps themselves. Yeah, that was uh, my point too. And that was actually one of the reasons why we went, well, like, well, dot bot, is it a, is it a woman bot? Is it a man bot? And what is it? And we're like, well, it's, it's just a robot. <laughs> it's neither. <laughs> um, but we did add arms. So that is definitely anthropomorphizing. Uh, to a certain extent, for sure. To, to a degree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see, oh, I do oh, see another question yeah. coming in. Um, there was evidence for the computer voices in American jets to be that of a pilot's wife. Evidence showed that they paid more attention to it. Oh. Interesting. Um, really? I was, okay. was going to bring up, um, I don't know if you, either you, Jana or Will or anyone in the audience um, heard about Facebook, um, their experiment with their AI and what happened when they try to make it think like a human. Um, it actually got out of control and it ended up creating its own language, even though it wasn't designed to even do that. Um, so they immediately shut it down um, and killed the project. Now, there's something to be said as to whether they actually may have accidentally created Skynet <laughs> or did they just shut it down because they thought oh, that this just completely failed. Um, but it was interesting, you know, because Will brought up that whole uh, rationality and, and acting and thinking like a human. This machine just went out of control and created its own secret language that nobody else could understand. Yeah. Is, Will, do you, do you remember that one? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, it does ring a bell. Yeah, this is one just to completely um, bring this back to sort of a, a, almost a very simple understanding sort of definition of this is like um, what, uh, a really interesting definition that goes, that goes around in AI is like a, a so sort of complex system is, but I think by definition is one that you cannot predict what it's going to do. Which means that, and so a lot of AI systems are complex systems. So you can put these bits together, put these algorithms together, you know, input some data, see what's going to happen, but you can't predict every single scenario that's going to happen. And um, that is obviously a perfect case for that. They put some stuff together, hoping that something would happen and something else happened. And they, they obviously thought, oh, oh goodness, put politely. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, we need to shut this down because we don't know what it's doing. This is a really interesting thing with, um, uh, just the tangent completely, uh, bringing AI into uh, your products is, is to say to your, your boss, I want to put this system in place and I don't know what it's going to do. And it might do something good or it might do something bad, but if it does something bad, then we'll change it and it'll do something good hopefully next time. And most people are probably just going to go, you're, you're, you're mental, why are you going to do that? Because um, <laughs> you can't predict the output. And so it's got to be really, really carefully managed and really carefully done. And um, I think a lot of um, you know Google, Facebook, Microsoft are doing these things uh, and they've got the power to really run some really, really big systems as well. So they're coming up with some really interesting behaviors. Obviously bringing up the Microsoft uh, Twitter bot, they didn't know what that was gonna do. That turned into a very controversial Twitter bot within 24 oh, right. hours and shut yeah. down. Does everyone remember this... um, uh, Tay, the, the Microsoft bot? Oh, I yeah. never heard of that, but I feel like oh, I look it up now. It, it was a bot that basically learned from people's, uh, let's say bad language and, and negative negativity on Twitter and soon started spouting its own negativity on Twitter. I, I can just based on that, I can only imagine. <laughs> Um, cool. I think we're going to wrap up with uh, a rude bot that learned some bad words. Um, so thank you everyone for, uh, for joining today. We will be sending out the recording over the next couple of days. Um, so you can always share it or watch it back if you happen to drop off like a friend Carl earlier. I do apologize, Carl, if you're looking back at this, we did see you um, and hope you have an opportunity to watch this back. Uh, so thank you everyone uh, once again. Uh, with that said, uh, happy end of the year. Happy holidays. Uh, and we will see you in 2020. Thanks for joining everyone. Thank you. Bye.